Our next uh, talk is a science highlight uh, entitled Sun to Earth, Sure, Yet Still One Link Short, Results from the NSF Frontiers of Earth System Dynamics Sun to Ice Project. Talk will be given by Harlan Spence. Thank you and good morning everyone. Uh, first wanted to thank the organizers for the invitation to talk a little bit about uh, some recent results we have from the uh, Frontiers of Earth Systems Dynamic a Program Project that we have uh, at the University of New Hampshire along with a large group called Sun to Ice. Uh, today it's going to be Sun to Atmosphere and I think a message that I would like to pass along is that uh, even though we had anticipated a sun to ice connection. We're one link short at present. We're sun to atmosphere. And I think there are some interesting aspects of that. If this is not a confusing enough title, let me alter up a, uh, offer up an alternative. Um, how I learned to stop worrying and love ionizing radiation, but really it's how I start worrying and hate ionizing radiation. And um, if you think this is going in a weird place, here we go, Dr. Strangelove. Um, there's a connection, though, at these atmospheric altitudes, ionizing radiation from above. We heard a lot about from Tim from below, but ionizing radiation from above uh, does have an impact on the solar terrestrial system. So energetic particles coming from the sun and the galaxy uh, deposit their energy, create ionizing rate, uh, uh, conditions in the upper middle atmosphere, chemistry changes, and certainly we know this is true at aircraft altitudes. When we look at uh, what happens as one of these energetic particles hits the upper atmosphere, it produces this very rich and complex cascade of subatomic particles that rain down through the atmosphere, starting at, say, balloon altitudes at 100,000 uh, uh, feet or so, certainly down into uh, aircraft altitudes. But really a question we had was uh, whether or not the chemistry produced in the middle atmosphere can find its way to the ice and uh, more or less be a permanent record of extreme and historic uh, solar energetic particles as a way of uh, essentially peering back in time at what the sun might have been doing deep in the past. So uh, pardon my Dr. Strangelove uh, connections. It's one of my favorite movies. So let me start with an, a little bit of initial background and motivation for how this project got started. There was a, a paper in 1990 by uh, Dreshoff and Zeller that uh, basically made a connection between what they were looking at in uh, the GISP ice core, which was really looking at climate change, but they noticed uh, in one of the uh, ways they looked at it in terms of nitrates, they saw these spikes. Uh, and uh, that example is shown down at the bottom here on this record here, 1853 to 1862. And here in 1859, you can see an annual variation in the uh, nitrate uh, signature, and then this spike of nitrates, which they then uh, obviously made a uh, connection between the great white light flare of 1859, the so-called Carrington flare. Uh, following that, this group and colleagues started looking at um, other parts of the ice record, and McCracken et al., say, in 2001, proposed that the pathway for the creation was that these very energetic solar energetic particles would penetrate to low altitudes, participate in ozone chemistry, converting that uh, ozone into NOY, subsequent downward transport, the NO NOY then snows out and then becomes entrained in the uh, polar ice. Uh, so interesting idea, and certainly it was one of uh, a correlation, but was there causation? So this association accelerated around that time, Palmer et al. Uh, looked at a statistical analysis of the frequency of uh, NOI that was found in ice cores from La Dome. Uh, and what they did is they looked at the average annual nitrate cycle. So just going back to this, to this variability here. And uh, looked at the periods when we knew that there were significant solar particle events during that year. So rather than look at individual events, they just sort of looked at the annual average. And what they found was that there was a statistical significant association between the two, suggesting that there may be a solar contribution to the nitrate uh, in polar ice. And so this was an additional positive uh, correlation uh, suggesting a causal relationship between SEPs and nitrates in Arctic ice, and, and it, in particular, uh, I think the, the uh, uh, 
holy grail, if you will, are the spikes, not just that low uh, time average, but the spikes. Around that time, the uh, glaciochemist uh, community uh, really was very unhappy with this because they didn't think there was any possible way that the ice chemistry could work. And so uh, a group at Bass, led by Eric Wolf, started looking at a systematic analysis of daily nitra nitrate deposition uh, during 2004 and 2005. And uh, they found no association of nitra nitrate deposition with uh, solar events. They looked at a couple of events uh, in July and August. It had a very large uh, proton fluence. And uh, despite that, they saw no, uh, no uh, uh, NOI detection above the threshold that would have been predicted based on the scaling done by the uh, Carrington flare. And in fact, in, on 20th January 2005, there was a ground level enhancement event. So this is a very large solar proton event that produces uh, uh, ground level effects. Uh, also did not observe any time associated NOI increase. So, Despite the Palmer results, the Wolf revolts uh, more or less uh, suggested that any causal relationship between the Arctic and uh, uh, be between the SEPs and Arctic uh, nitrate spikes was um, tenuous at best. And in fact, they put forward many theoretical ar arguments as to why this couldn't work, just because of the uh, the way the photolysis would tend to destroy any NOI that was uh, on the uh, Arctic ice. So this controversy continued in the late 2000s. Larry Kepko and a group of us at BU looked at an independent ice core to see if we could get to the, to the root of this. We used a, a continuous flow technique that allowed us to get very high time resolution in the ice uh, samples. And lo and behold, we found very well resolved impulsive uh, NOI uh, peaks during essentially uh, all of the large solar cosmic ray ground level events in the 1940s and 1950s. Uh, and so this led us to conclude, based on these kind of measurements of the nitrate uh, concentration, uh, both in summit and in windless bite, you can see these various uh, spikes here in the nitrate rec record, along with the times and dates of ground level uh, enhancement events. Uh, again, it's a correlation, not a causative uh, assessment, but it led us to believe that there was uh, uh, evidence that there was a connection here. Uh, so it was kind of a back and forth between the various groups. In 2012 then, Eric Wolf came back and went specifically to look for the Carrington event in a number of uh, ice core records, the GISP, ZO, D4, NEEM, and B20. These are all just different expeditions. And uh, essentially said that the only one that saw any evidence for the Carrington event was the one that Zeller and McCracken had looked at. And so at best, if there is a record, um, you can't use it for accu accurately estimating events because uh, sometimes it doesn't snow in a location, you, as one can imagine. So it's uh, God's uh, recorder. Sometimes he turns the snow on, sometimes he doesn't. God with a lower G. So a uh, lot of controversy up until that time. And so uh, there was the speculation then that 1859 event uh, was seen in the uh, GISP H core perhaps was seen in other cores around that time. Dating is a, is a little difficult with some of these cores. The other thing, too, is that uh, by looking at other uh, chemical tracers in the ice, not just the nitrate, you can look at ammonium, for instance, and that's an indicator of um, other things. Uh, you can look for indications of biomass burning events, which will produce nitrates, uh, pollution in the modern era, and even uh, storms coming in from the sea will uh, increase the uh, nitrate concentration. So uh, uh, Wolf basically was clear that the nitrate spikes cannot be used to derive the statistics of SEPs. This, of course, was uh, challenged at the 2012 Extreme Space Weather Event uh, workshop by Smart and Shea, so the debate went on. Around that time, I would say, we went from uh, talking or perhaps in parentheses shouting at one another across communities, across journals that uh, different communities didn't read, working together toward a resolution. So I think we've gone from, um, from confusion to, to resolution. And part of that, now I'm getting to the sun to ice part, was a project uh, led 
at Uni University of New Hampshire, uh, started in late 2011 as part of this uh, one, one time Frontiers in Earth Systems Dynamic program. Very nice um, opportunity to bring together a very diverse set of uh, researchers looking at literally sun to ice and all of the connections, physical connections that uh, produce energetic particles, transport them, move them through uh, geospace to the upper atmosphere, produce the chemical uh, changes in the atmosphere, and then look at uh, potential transport to the ice. Uh, let me just summarize now a little bit of what we do in the, in the final chain of this link, the one that, uh, as you'll see, is, is a bit broken at present. Um, it, it's a really uh, fantastic program, I would say, and I would encourage NSF to do more of these very interdisciplinary uh, projects that allowed us to bring together a number of people from very diverse communities that you would say map into Shine, Gem, and CEDAR uh, to tackle this uh, challenging pro program. You can see a number of people here uh, in the atmospheric community who, uh, who are probably out there if I look carefully. So we focused on uh, some space age events where we knew that we had a, an event occurring, we knew the properties of that event, and we could sample the snow directly. And so uh, we compared these uh, event periods with data that we had sampled uh, daily at Summit, and uh, we identified events most probably associated with non-SEP sources using chemical tracers and eliminated, eliminated those. So those associated with biomass burning events, sea salt, dust, and pollution, any remaining ones then, we, we s tried to see if we could explain them using atmospheric models, Wacom in particular. And uh, these are results uh, published recently by Kathy Duderstadt in a uh, paper she led that's published just recently a few uh, weeks ago, JGR Atmospheres, looking at um, uh, deposition, at potentially deposition at Summit Greenland during a solar proton event in November uh, 2009. So the basic idea is um, during favorable conditions, we have a sta stable polar vortex. We have solar energetic protons that enter uh, the polar cap. Uh, there's ionization and dissociation of N2 and O2 that leads to uh, the Hox and Nox creation and then uh, uh, connected to the ozone uh, chemistry that leads uh, the Nox to NOY, a lower altitude uh, uh, deposition of the NOY that then has various pathways potentially to the surface using wet deposition, cloud sedimentation, evaporation, and then even dry deposition. So uh, what Kathy did was identify several events for uh, during the period of interest that uh, had spikes in the nitrate concentration and that were not accounted for by, by other soluble ion correlation. So these are the ones that didn't seem to have the other um, attributes that one um, might lead to believe had to do with biomass burning or some of the other non-SEP sources. Then ran simulations based on the driving conditions in Wacom for these three periods. The, these are some of the results from that Wacom uh, period, a case with uh, no solar proton events uh, put in the SEP enhancement, uh, and so you can see the, uh, the contribution of adding the SEP. Uh, so uh, the background then, in other words, is, is by this. If there are no SEP, this is what the situation would look, look like, uh, which is a thick background pool of 10 to 15 parts per billion by volume of NOI in the lower stratosphere. The solar proton, over time, this is a uh, several month period here, showing a thin layer, maybe five kilometers or so, of uh, five to 10 parts per billion per volume um, of SEP enhanced NOI at 25 to 30 kilometers. And you can see this low, slow downward transport. Another way to look at this is the total uh, column density with the SEP and without the SEP. And you can see the, the difference here between those two. The SEP enhancement is less than 5% of the total uh, column density. And if we look uh, just above 50, 30 kilometers, you can see uh, it's, it's more pronounced uh, difference there, which means that um, the uh, effect at the local maximum is about 20% there. But by the time you get all the way down to the surface, it's much less. So uh, the conclusion here is that this enhancement, which is very small, over the entire uh, column is uh, not nearly large enough to explain the four to five fold uh, spikes that are seen in the nit nitrates and in the ice. Uh, we can 
we can do this uh, same kind of analysis, but now not take a, um, a, a measured event where we're looking at comparing directly to the ice, but rather take the largest SEP that we've seen in the last 50 years and then multiply it by 10. Just crank it way up to see what will happen. And um, in this case, uh, with the uh, uh, 1989, largest in the last 50 years, SEP event, similar kind of analysis, we can get maybe a 10% effect. Again, not uh, hundreds of percent, but only 10%. And if we take 10 times that 1989 event, which was, would, we believe would be uh, truly historic, uh, you can get maybe 60 to 70% with only at the uh, maximum altitude, only 100%, a doubling or so. Certainly not a four to five fold uh, increase at the surface. So this modeling uh, suggests that we really can't, uh, can't get there. This is uh, just showing that same 1989 uh, period with, uh, with no S SPEs, just showing the background conditions of the atmosphere at that time. And then uh, with the uh, enhancements of the SEP, again, very similar sort of uh, a spectrum here or a downward transport of the NOI on the same sort of time scale, uh, relatively sl slow uh, transport down, but certainly nothing like the enhancement needed at the surface to produce the spikes that are being seen. Uh, this is another, another way of uh, looking at that same uh, sort of data, just showing the uh, NOI uh, concentrations as a function of potential temperature or altitude over here uh, for the November 2000 event, uh, uh, comparing the before, and, uh, no SEP and after, uh, and you can see certainly at the, at, at the maximum altitude there is an increase, but certainly not at the uh, surface. And for completeness, here is the October 89, the blue being the red before or without an SEP, the October 89 uh, blue, and then 10 times. Uh, so you can see with the uh, initial impact after two weeks and after six weeks, there is that downward motion, but again, at the surface, uh, a pittance of uh, NOI. So to conclude, while SPE significantly incre increase the reactive nitrogen and, and a decrease in the uh, ozone in the stratosphere uh, following the November 2000 events, is well known, there is no convincing evidence, though, that the SPEs are related to impulsive nitrate spikes seen in the ice core. Um, in fact, for most of the spikes, we're finding that tropospheric sources provide a uh, pretty rich and, and complex set of alternative explanations for the spike seen uh, during the, the winter period that we've looked at in detail in 2000, 2001. That said, we're still looking for that holy grail. What can we find in the uh, geologic record that might help us unravel what the sun has been doing. So one thing we're looking at is uh, whether there is, if we keep turning the knob up, at what point is the sun capable of producing an event large enough to produce spikes at the source? And how does that compare, compare with the limits of what we'd expect from solar flare uh, intensity? Uh, also of interest is the longer, our longer term variations in the nitrate. That was the Palmer type uh, studies that do uh, tell us maybe more about uh, uh, based on the galactic cosmic ray properties, uh, how the sun and its magnetic field has varied in the deep past. And then finally, and I think more interestingly, um, is what are the alternate proxies that we might look for, uh, either chemical or radionuclides that, uh, and isotopes that might allow us to uh, peel back a, and understand uh, solar variability. So while at present we don't have a, a good uh, way of using impacts in the upper atmosphere to tell us something about ice. We hope to get that in the uh, coming years. So let me end with one impact that I know that would happen in the ice if we had it. Uh, so thank you very much for your attention. And <laughs>